So there's a, a couple hundred registered at the moment. So that's great. That's great. All right, Tom, you're good to go. Stuart at the moment. So that's good afternoon. My name is Tom Lindsay, and I work at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you back to the National Association of Scholars Conference on the 1619 Project. What we're going to be examining now with our panel is the topic of how to teach American history properly. And we have three distinguished guests whom I would like to introduce, and then they will make short statements. In alphabetical order, uh, we'll begin with Jamie Gass. Jamie Gass is the Pioneer Institute's director of the Center for School Reform. He will be followed by Richard Johnson, who is the director of the Booker T. Washington Initiative at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And I'm proud to say he is my colleague. Last but not least, Professor Robert Maranto is the 21st Century Chair in Leadership at the Department of Education Reform at the University of Arkansas. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, uh, we'll begin with you. Would you give a short presentation about your view of this subject of how to teach American history properly? Sure, Tom, thank you so much. And I really wanna thank uh, NAS, uh, Peter Wood and Dave Randall and others for uh, putting on this conference and all the excellent work that they they do. I've known Peter for quite a long time and really admire him and the and the leadership that he's provided at at NAS. Uh, so I come from this uh, from the K twelve uh, space. I've uh, worked in and around K twelve education for almost thirty years now, and I kind of have a, a, a tale to tell here about Massachusetts, which is where Pioneer to do where I'm from uh, is located. So. Uh, in K-12 education, I think generally people agree that over the last uh, 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 25 years or so, Massachusetts has emerged as the preeminent K-12 education performer as measured by NAEP and TIMS and all of the academic uh, measures. There's a lot of things that we did well, and a lot of them, frankly, are attributable to the quality of the political leadership we had at the time but also through the careful academic work of Sandra Stotsky. She really developed high quality uh, standards in English and math and uh, science and social studies. And she did it by uh, really bringing high quality academic content specialists to the table. That A lot of what folks know about K-12 education and why it struggled so much is that it's been sort of pedagogically heavy uh, held captive in a lot of regards to the School of Education. Well, Sandy and the work of the people of the, of the Edward Reform Law in 93 really helped break that. They really moved the conversation towards academic quality uh, in, in a serious, serious way. And then they aligned it with uh, standardized tests, uh, MCAS tests, uh, high stakes tests, teacher testing, so that the teachers and the students were all going to be tested on the, on the same material. But the central focus really of the work that Sandy did uh, is, was on academic quality and bringing uh, a, a commitment to classic literature, poetry and drama, uh, high quality mathematics standards are developed by mathematicians and historians. And so uh, the one area that we sort of have fallen short on has been US history, even though in the original Ed Reform Law uh, as crafted by Bill Weld and, and the Democratic uh, co-authors, that was quite specific that the Federalist Papers and the founding documents and state history and national history should be included. And in fact, it was just much more specific than any other content area. The reality is, is that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in his wisdom essentially ignored it. Uh, she developed these great standards that I think were universally regarded by right-leaning and left-leaning people as very traditional, high quality, um, attentive to the, the, the appropriate political and military history of the country and the West, uh, as well as I think very fair representation of, of often underrepresented groups. Uh, but, the, the, but the sort of entrenched uh, bureaucratic establishment in, 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 the, in our state just obstructed it. And it really started pretty early on. It was kind of a revolt of the clerks, but uh, you know, it, 10 years uh, or more ago, they, they canceled the test. Deval Patrick came in and he canceled the test. Uh, and then they began to work at saying, oh, well, this, there's, there's too much history in the history standards. 
and then after sort of uh, dribbling out the clock over and over again, then they finally made some revisions onto those standards just a couple of years ago. And instead of subtracting things, they added things. And most of it really had the outlook of what I think what people are familiar with now is, is, is history or civics as basically community organizing. There's a lot of influence from iCivics National Organization, which you know frankly has pushed for video games instead of academic content. Uh, the general outlook of the revisions uh, really seemed to look as though uh, the, the country started in about 1960 and that everything began to have more of a, a kind of a victim's view of history rather than the traditional political or military history that I think most people for decades would have uh, been able to identify. But I, I think as, as well as Massachusetts did in terms of its overall uh, performance and neglecting uh, history, one of the big problems here is, is that a lot of, even some of the allies on the right, and I'll mention the Fordham Institute as being one of them, they often have kind of made common cause with a lot of the DC-based trade groups who for decades really have had no interest at all in the liberal arts or in uh, high quality academics. They've been much more interested in K-12 education and education more generally as workforce development. And from my point of view, that that's not really education, that's properly understood as training. Uh, and so the, the, the uh, outlook of these national players really kind of brushing aside the constitution and federalism have pushed for things like, uh, uh, you know, school to work was one in the, in the 90s. We've had iterations of, of, uh, of uh, race to the top and common core and social emotional learning, all these different fads and the willingness of uh, uh, sort of a, many of the people in the education establishment to give cover to the college board as they were doing some significant damage to, to uh, the SAT and through and a push. Um, it's all kind of set the stage now so that history is so far back in the corner in terms of what's taught even in a high performing state like Massachusetts or a state that had good standards or in California where you know, the old Diane Ravitch did a quite a good job with, uh, with traditional history standards. But this um, recent push to nationalize everything has not only shunted history aside because, uh, well, uh, No Child Left Behind and it's true of ESSA and a lot of the federal initiatives really have, I think, in fairness, narrowed the curriculum to primarily English and math. Uh, but it is just set the stage where the people that are pushing for the 1619 and other, uh, what I regard as sort of overly uh, politicized visions of, of, of history or of teaching America's past, now have lots of running room because uh, on top of this, the country not doing particularly well and it's measured by NAEP on history and civics, uh, the, the current moment and the political correctness are all coming to bear. And so uh, there's a huge void. And that void, from my point of view, is often being um, filled with folks with, a, with an overt political agenda. It, it's not really history in, in any way, shape, or form, or even civics that they're interested in. It is history as political activism. And uh, there was a bill just a couple of years ago in Massachusetts, the governor of Massachusetts ultimately signed it, but this bill uh, really was mandatory uh, uh, civic engagement. It's sort of a, should be, it sounds like an oxymoron, but it's sort of a, a, a volunteerism that is compelled. And he had some reservations about, about the provisions, but ultimately uh, made some tweaks and then they signed off in it. And I think we know whether it's in a state like Massachusetts or frankly, a lot of other states, uh, you see that these state departments of education, which really not only control in a lot of instances, the K-12 curriculum but, and the testing, uh, but also have input on teacher preparation. Over the long haul, they know that they can wait out any kind of uh, incremental uh, reservations that people might might have. But, you know, I guess my outlook really from the beginning uh, of all this work for 25 or 30 years is, has really been kind of informed by, I think, the founders that 
anyone familiar with the founding fathers knew and knows that history and knowledge of history, not only of our uh, uh, country, uh, but Western civilization is elemental to understanding uh, represented government. And that that was the fundamental outlook of K-12 education. That's what they thought the primary purpose of schooling was, whether it was being conducted in folks' homes or through religious organizations or whether it was publicly supported uh, schools. And I, you know, and so that's the outlook that I think that should be prevailing. I think that the polling data often shows that that's what the outlook that most people prefer. And yet through one way or another, the, the education establishment, it's not just the teachers unions, again, it's the, the governor's association, the CCSSO, a lot of these trade organizations, they really don't have much interest in the liberal arts or history or history being taught in kind of a meaningful way that is going to inform citizenship uh, that is, is grounded in, in, in background knowledge, the way someone like Edie Hirsch has talked about, but it really is a kind of warmed over workforce development outlook. And uh, it, in some respects, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a Republican administration or Democratic administration in DC, they all kind of in one way, shape or form have signed off on it. And so I think that the moment that we find ourselves in is, is uh, in terms of COVID is, you know, nature's uh, hand working here. But the crisis that we have in K-12 education in terms of teaching history is totally man-made. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's easily traceable. It, it is uh, a, got a variety of different players that have really for quite some time been uh, opposed to teaching kids the fundamentals of their, of their shared past. And I think that the kind of balkanization and fragmentation that you see today is, a, is the natural result of that. So I may have been, uh, I, I may be offer, offering more of a, a uh, autopsy than what, how it should be taught, but I think that, that it, the, the anti-model that I've, I've, I've explained, I think hopefully will help set the stage for how we can think about going, going forward. Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson. I think you're on you're on mute, Dr. Johnson. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yes. Thank you. I want to thank uh, the National Association of Scholars and uh, of course David and Peter and everybody that that brought this together. Thank you, Tom, and uh, our colleagues at TPPF. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Dr. Frankel, Victor E. Frankel said in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, once you find the why, then, you know, what you have to do to achieve things, uh, the, the, the what is no big deal. And I think uh, once, we, once we address the why, you know, why is it that, that history and civics have been watered down to a degree of ineffectiveness in our education systems, uh, then the voices of, of, of truth and the voices for uh, the necessity and the reality that we need to, our children need to know history and civics then becomes more profound. You know, the when we look at it, and, and I was listening to Jamie a moment ago, and, and most of his points were directly, you know, spot dead on when he talks about, uh, you know, how politics comes into play. Uh, you know, if you here in the state of Texas, the State Board of Education basically, you know, approves curriculum. Uh, and, and, and so who's on the State Board of Education and what type of folks are on the State Board of Education and then what politics comes into play with that? You know, I would I would differ a little bit uh, uh, in terms of the critique uh, associated with the teachers union, because I think they're a very powerful group and and they influence the politics of our day uh, through their through their powerful lobbyists uh, that that tends to move the agenda in their direction. Uh, even though it may be coming from members of the State Board of Education uh, at the end of the day, but the, the, the power that's behind them and then why, why is it 
that uh, the, the powers that are behind them would, uh, would want us to muzzle the mouth of history and, uh, and, and true history. And then teaching that to our, our, our students, simply because I think the why is because if you read the, the, the Constitution, the US Constitution, and, um, and you read the Declaration of Independence, then you begin to understand the spirit of freedom uh, that those documents were formed in. And, uh, and then at an early age, you, you put that in the mindset of children, that spirit of freedom. Uh, and if those things are then taken out and say, well, we're not gonna allow them to read that, or they're not, because once you read the Declaration of Independence, uh, then you're, you're also, you know, challenged to find out where did, where did the founders come up with, with the Declaration of Independence? Where did they do their research? And then you start to read a little bit about Montesquieu. And then you start to read a little bit about John Locke. And you start to read a little bit about uh, Blackstone. And, and find out that this thing, you know, history, it goes further and further back. And it ties itself into the free will of God, sovereign God, that uh, that declares all men to be created equal, and 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 endowed it with certain inalienable rights, and uh, and freedom is one, and life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and uh, so when we see that that being muzzled, then we have to try to figure out why are these folks doing what they're doing. And, and the reason that they're doing what they're doing because it is an attack on freedom. And, and, and if you look in certain, in certain areas, that's the reason why I'm such a big supporter of, of school, of parents having the right to choose uh, the best educational opportunities or options for their kids to meet their kids' needs, their children's needs, simply because if you look in your urban centers, it's almost wiped out. And, and, and where do you find people who hate, you know, who, who, are, who are disgruntled with America most, uh, generally in your urban centers? Uh, where do you find people who, who, who can hate the flag and who, who, uh, who basically charge er every wrong thing that's happening in the world to the United States of America? The, the bigger portion of those folks, you're going to find them in the, in the urban centers, the inner cities of America, where, you know, these particular school boards then have basically erased uh, uh, a pathway to the real true history of, of the United States of America. Um, and I, I like to talk about the, the US Constitution because I, I see the Constitution, and I tell my students, the Constitution is a glorious document of freedom. And if you are a freedom fighter, that is your sword. You pick up your sword because we saw, we saw you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln pick up that sword in the Cooper's address. He, he really brought it out in, 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 his, in, his, in his Cooper's Union address uh, and, and utilize that to move forward and then come forward with the third, well, start the Civil War, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but the thing of it is, you know, some, some things needed to be because basically the, the document does not substantiate uh, man as property. And it never expressly or distinctly mentions man as property. And so the South basically felt like, uh, you know, that the, the Constitution should protect their right to, to own their property, but the, but the Constitution never said that. But if we never read it, and, we're never, and our kids are never taught to read it, then they won't know that the Constitution referred to all people as persons, and, and even in, in Article One, Section 2. And so if our, if our children are never taught to read that, then they, could, they would come up believing that the, the founding fathers of America hated black people and, and expressly put them in there as slaves. Uh, but, but slavery isn't mentioned until the 13th Amendment. 
And that's when uh, that's when Lincoln steps in and takes it upon, you know, not just himself, but and, and op- takes an opportunity to help the U.S. Constitution grow up a little bit more, come more into its own. And uh, and then we see 99 years later uh, with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the U.S. Constitution grows a little bit more into its own, but it's always growing into the point where the founding fathers wanted it to be, which is a nation of free men. And uh, and so when you know we can't look at the U.S. Constitution. Uh, as a in a snapshot, we have to we have to look at it as a growing document. But then understand each time it grows a little bit, what's going on in the social and political climate of that day. And so I believe that there are forces out there that do not want our young people to learn these things early on. And I think that those forces are behind the school boards. Well, I don't know how other states operate, but I know in Texas, the the the, the Texas uh, school board, Texas Board of Education, are the ones who approve curriculums. But let's just say the the body that approves the curriculums, who's behind that body, and it usually it it usually will be, you'll find political forces behind that body <clears throat> that's manipulating, uh, manipulating the, the system and then uh, allowing a situation to exist where we're filtering down uh, who America is, what America is, and, and what we stand for in America. And that's our fight. You know, at the end of the day, when the die is cast and all is said and done, folks are going to have to hear hear the voices of the scholars that spend decades and spend their careers studying uh, the 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 particular subject matter, and they are the subject matter experts. And the subject matter expert voices are going to have to be heard far beyond where our political forces are allowing us to be heard at this moment. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And an unhappy fact here that I will report before we turn to to Dr. Maranto. Um, A couple of years ago here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, I started a summer institute for Texas high school civics teachers. And it's been a wonderful experience. We read the founding documents, surprise, surprise. But in the very first class, a teacher in Texas, the last time K-12 students get anything to deal with the founding is eighth grade. So we had an eighth grade civics teacher there at our class. And she said, in front of the whole class, she said her experience is that by the time kids today are middle school age, middle school age, they come to class already cynical about the American regime. Now, I was shocked when I heard that. So I asked the rest of the teachers, I said, is that your experience? And they said, yes, and it gets worse every year. On that happy note, we now turn to (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Maranto. Hopefully, can you all hear me? Can I come through? Yes. Yes. Okay, I, I I would suspect immigrants have a much more positive view because they've seen other places. And... If you haven't seen other places, it's easy to think that America is, is pretty bad, but we're, we're actually the, the, probably the best house in a, in a pretty bad global neighborhood. <laughs> but um, I, my talk, and I'm glad to send it to anybody, it's just kind of a draft, is, uh, is America over heritage, history, and 1619. I was, I was struck by uh, what, what both of my predecessors said here. Um, it, recently, there was a, a poll that found that the um, a significant number of Republicans, I believe it was 40%, thought that Trump was a better president than Washington. That was the good news. The bad news is the party of brains, the Democrats, by a majority, thought that, that Obama was, was better than Washington. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm on the C-SPAN board of historians and political scientists. That I, I'm a presidency scholar, used to be. Um, 
I rank them. No, just no. Trump and Obama. No, objectively, no. <laughs> They're not there with Washington. We are not teaching history well if people are, are coming up with, with this kind of thing, this widely viewed. So I'm going to outline the differences between heritage and history. And I'll suggest that 1619 proposes to replace both history and heritage with sort of a negative heritage, sort of a deficit model of America. And I'm going to suggest a bunch of ways to to counter this. And I, I, I would argue the 1619 culture war in a lot of ways is the defining political conflict of the 2020s. And, and honestly, if the majority loses, America could very easily end. And, and you know, I'm, my family, we speak, you know, like my grandparents were Sicilian, my family, we speak English well, we're all well-educated. We can always be camp to Canada or Australia or someplace, but we'd rather stay here. This is actually a pretty nice place uh, as my grandparents knew all too well. So um, heritage differs from history. All peoples have a heritage, not all people have history. Heritage basically tells the positive stories about a tribe. It, it provides the reasons why that tribe should continue. Um, a friend of mine actually was a, was a historian who was offered the chance once to be the, the historian for the Marine Corps. And he thought about it and ultimately said no, because while he respected the Marines, he said, Marines don't do history, they do heritage. It's not what I do. Heritage is why we want the tribe to continue on. It's, it's a collection of stories about why we're important and why we're great in some way. Uh, maybe we're not the greatest, but we're great in some way. Uh, history is different. History is more often a discourse among intellectuals, what really happened and how different people might view it, it, it which is one reason why we need diverse historians who will, uh, I think probably ethnically, but certainly ideologically diverse, who might ask a different set of questions. Um, history strives or should strive for something like objectivity through scientific or quasi-scientific processes of, of testing theories of conjectures and refutations. And again, those work best if we have a diverse set of people asking the questions. Because they'll ask different kinds of questions. 1619 is as a result of, of the New York Times, a very, very non-diverse set of people who started out with a certain mindset in terms of what they would find. And so inevitably it was going to be deeply flawed. Um, not even necessarily insincere, but deeply, deeply flawed. Um, history is also, history is in search of objective truth. History is also comparative. History compares one thing to another thing. So we, we don't study Napoleon because he was short. There were a lot of people who were short. I'm short. Uh, we study him because he did amazing things militarily and, and governmentally. Some of them were horrible, but they were amazing, right? We don't study Stalin because he had really bad acne, right? Why should we study America for its slavery, given that when America was founded, virtually every nation state had slavery? All of them did. Why would people have come to the US to protect slavery when it was protected everywhere already? It makes no sense on the face of it. Uh, something I'll get to in a little bit. There's, there's no comparative knowledge, no comparative ignorance. Um, so the, so, so the, uh, and here, let me, let me put up something. Let me see if I can successfully share a screen. I'm really bad at this stuff. Um, there it is. Okay. Do people see the map up there? Yes. Okay. You can Google this very easily. It's in my list of citations. Um, here's my first proposal. I want us to lobby to put this in every school room in America. And as you'll see, America is not a great laggard on slavery. Some of us were ahead of the curve. Some of us were roughly with the curve. I know when the Civil War happened, um, 26 nation states representing most of the world still had slavery. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, very few people know this. I got it from Thomas Sowell's wonderful essay, The Real History of Slavery, in his, um, uh, in his book, um, uh, Rednecks and Black Rednecks and White Liberals. Um, the term slave comes from Slav because the Slavs were enslaved by other Europeans, by Turks, by Arabs. People would, would capture Slavs and sell them. Uh, hence the term slave. Um, slavery was, was, I mean, look at the map, it was, it was everywhere until quite recently. And it's a wonderful achievement by the, by the West, by largely Anglo-Americans, well, Anglos largely, um, rankered in liberal theory to have gotten rid of slavery, mostly in just one century, the 1800s. Um, it's an incredible thing. And, it, and so it's very galling when I hear people like, like former Har Lynn Harvard President Drew Gilpin Faust declare that she has to apologize for Harvard's legacy of slavery when I know darn well as a university president, she was soliciting money from Saudi princes who in their youths owned people because Saudi Arabia did not get rid of slavery until 1962. I would never define Saudi Arabia that way, by the way. That would be, I think, in some respect, very prejudicial. Um, 
slavery actually played a role in the 1860. American presidential contest, as we know. Few of us know it played a role in the 1919 Mauritanian presidential contest, where the anti-slavery candidate got 18%, lost pretty badly. Uh, slavery is still a thing in Mauritania and various other places. But again, I think it would be wrong to define Mauritania that way. It would be even bigoted to define it that way. Islamic countries were a bit of a laggard on this. Some of my best friends are Islamic. I've done a lot of field work in, in Islamic schools. I would never define Islam that way. I would see that as bigoted. So as an American, I see it as incredibly bigoted, incredibly anti-American to define my country by the fact that for a long time it had slavery. I'm just really offended by that. And people should be complaining about that all. Um, so the, uh, so it's, it, this isn't history. It, the second point is not history. It's not scientific, it's not comparative. It's an attempt to destroy heritage and impose a different heritage, negative heritage. Uh, if you will, deficit thinking, to use a term from the left, explaining why our tribe, the Americans, should not continue. It's only the most negative parts of American history, not others. It would be as if, I mean, I, when I teach courses in U.S. government, which I actually have them for a while now, I teach public policy, I'll usually have five, six, seven percent on African Americans in public policy, a lot of very interesting things there. Um, but if I were teaching a course on African American history generally, I would, I would, not talk about, or maybe only in passing, talk about people like Frank Lucas and the Country Boys, who were major cocaine dealers, or mass murderer Wayne Williams, or corrupt politicians like Alcee Hastings. Uh, I would spend little or no time on that. I would spend a lot of time on Colin Powell, Jackie Robinson, George, George Washington Carver, Barack Obama, Phyllis Wheatley, the Harlem Renaissance. Only someone who hated African Americans would use the first approach. And we would call them out as bigots. And we need to be calling these people out as anti-American because that's what they are, intentionally or not. Um, again, third point, I've probably said this before, read Thomas Sowell's Real History of Slavery. It's amazing. Something that, that you guys should do, it's part of this, is make sure that that essay is widely circulated in curriculum boards and schools and so why does 1619 work so well? Supposedly it's in over 3000 school systems now. I wouldn't necessarily trust the measures, but it's in a lot of places for sure. And I would say on the elite level, it works in part because of incredible homogeneity among elites. Very few children or grandchildren, immigrants like me, uh, very few people in the center are right among intellectual elites, certainly. Uh, some efforts to stifle those who are, which are very problematic. Um, uh, I would also say, though, due to standpoint theory, in a book that all of you should read, it should be like the book of the year. And let me let me see if I can get out of that screen and get into my other screen. Um, it is new share or stop, let's see, is there a stop share? New share. Uh, uh, let's see if I can get into my. I'm not. I've. I'm no longer shown. Right. Let's see. Uh, I mean, know how to how I can do this. Oh. I wish I could. Okay, well, I'll, get, I'll um, pause here. Maybe pause here. Look. Yeah, you should be able to stop here. All right, stop here. There I am. Okay. There you go. So that, look at this. All right, this is um, critical cynical theories. I hope you can read it backwards. Um, by Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. It's interesting that when people have called uh, the people writing 1619 on some of their, their grievous factual errors that other people through the week have talked about, they'll say, "Well, that's your opinion." right, as a privileged person. This is standpoint theory, which is kind of a, a swept through the academy. Now, if you want to understand where some of this comes from, read Cynical Theory by Pluckrose and Lindsay. It explains it. Postmodern theory is an attack on science. It's saying there's no objective truth. Therefore, everything is up for grabs and everything's about power. And so if you can cancel culture somebody or censor them, you're, you're the winner, you're ahead. And we should not have allowed this to grow among elites, but we have, it's probably too late. Uh, and, and so it has a lot of purchase among elites, especially now that to some degree these people have the power, the power to cancel people. Witness the New York Times editor fired in June for, for being free speech, basically the New York Philadelphia Inquirer editor fired, quite a number of other people fired this spring. Uh, I'll get back to that later. So read Pluckles and, and Lindsay if you want to have a better sense of this. On the non-elite level, great marketing. Great marketing is part of this. 1619 Black Lives Matter, which I actually have some sympathy for. I've done some Black Lives Matter related scholarship, but I think it's been used in terrible ways. That's a longer story that I can't get into today. I had a Wall Street Journal piece on it in June. Um, these are essentially marketing works. They're not works of social science or science. And so we need to do counter marketing. That's something huge that we need to get a lot better at. 
I'll talk a little bit about this through part of counter marketing. Again, have that map with when slavery was abolished everywhere in every classroom in America makes it a lot harder when he looks at the map to argue that America was founded on slavery. The facts right in front of you. We should also have, by the way, some lines about why slavery was abolished in different places. The British Empire, for all its flaws, was the biggest engine of abolishing slavery. Uh, Winston Churchill and his youth played a role in a cavalry charge in Khartoum that abolished slavery in the Sudan. And then he went on to fight slavery in Nazi Germany and in Stalinist Russia. It's an incredible career, Churchill. We should, we should, ever, we should all learn about Churchill, amazing guy. Um, so the, on the non-elite level marketing, but also people want to believe something. And if we don't tell people any stories, what is history? It's stories. If we don't tell people those stories, they're going to be looking for something to believe in. And 1619 and other forms of history will jump in and fill the void. And here I want to mention a name that Jamie mentioned briefly, E.D. Hirsch, wonderful uh, uh, interview with him in the Wall Street Journal on 9-11. Uh, uh, he's had a number of great books out that I would recommend to anybody, and I have a list of them here. The School We Need and Why We Didn't Have Them is, is great. Uh, I cite it in every other thing I write. The Making of Americans is great. So E.D. Hirsch says, if we don't build citizens, if we don't teach people why maybe you want to be an American, and if we don't teach people American values like free speech, like freedom of religion, like representative government, then support for those values will wither away, which indeed we are seeing with the woke generation. E.D. Hirsch was pointing this out 40 years back. He still is today at the age of 92. Um, he has a curriculum. It's a damn good curriculum. Several thousand schools use it, and every state education commissioner should be trying to get their state to adopt E.D. Hirsch's core knowledge. It is wonderful. And we should use it as parents. When my kids were little, I would read to them from E.D. Hirsch wrote a bunch of bestsellers, what your first grader should know, what your second grader should know, et cetera, from, from really pre-K to seventh grade. And it's wonderful. I, I'd use it a lot as a parent. It's really fun. He tells stories. What's history and science about? It's about stories. Now, Hirsch himself was treated terribly by the education community at, at the University of Virginia and, and elsewhere. Um, and I uh, just relate one of those anecdotes he tells in The Making of Americans. He, I knew about this earlier. He would not let me tell it until he published it because he wanted to be loyal to UVA until he was retiring. Um, so he, he gave a talk before a bunch of educators and somebody asked him, you put together this curriculum, you know, what, what was the most interesting thing you learned? And he's talked about how he really learned about why the moon goes around the earth. And somebody said, well, you do, that. do you think that made you a better person? It's like, yeah, if you value education, yes, knowing more stuff makes you a better person, right? And a huge problem we have in education in ed schools is that they're not into education as, as many or most of us conceive it, as regular academics conceive of it. This is long an old story. E.D. Hirsch has told it better than I have in the, the schools that we need and why we don't have it. But Jonathan Way have a one, and I have a one, I think a very good piece out in the Journal of Intelligence called Why Intelligence Doesn't Matter in American Education Policy and Practice. And if you think about it, the field of education came about during the progressive era. And they wanted schools to be factories and they wanted, they wanted teachers to be factory workers. So they kind of wanted dumb compliant teachers. Um, and then they wanted to attract males to the field because professional meant male, so ed leaders would have to be male. And so the big thing they did was they hugely emphasized athletics. So if you look at a school nowadays, I've actually written some social justice oriented stuff because sometimes the SJ people get it right. One thing they get it right on is that promotion to school leadership is very much tied to race and gender, gender in particular. So um, who are most principals and even more superintendents? They are, uh, who are superintendents for sure? They're former secondary principals who are, who are males, who are former coaches. Most male principals are former coaches and virtually all of them as near as I can have played sports. I have national data on that, by the way. It's, it's not just me saying this, plus a lot of field work. They're great guys. I like them personally. They're not into academics. So, I mean, they've told me things. I was on school board for five years. I saw this close up. They see things, oh, your kid's taking too many AP classes. You need to have them come to football games. People value what they value, right? These guys are not into education. They're good guys, but they're not into education. Um, so we had one principal hired a couple math teachers who didn't know math and were a college town. There were a lot of complaints. And he told me about, oh, well, the kids can download it. It's okay. And I said, okay. This guy's a former principal of the year, by the way. He's not a marginal figure. He tweets to thousands of people every day. I said, okay, are you going to hire an offensive line coach for the football team who doesn't know how to protect the quarterback against a blitz? Because, you know, the kids can download it, right? And he said, oh, no, that's different. I said, I it's, it's important, right? Some of us think math is important. 
And I got the school superintendent to kind of put him in line. And the next year, hiring went better. But this is what's going on everywhere. We have a contempt for facts in education. What held the system together for a while, frankly, was the, the oppression of women and Blacks until the 70s. There was huge discrimination against women and African Americans. And so if you were female or Black, being a public school teacher was the best job you could get. And we could get some amazing teachers who knew content who were female or Black. I was the beneficiary of some of the, some of the Black ones in particular in the 70s. That's kind of gone now. We're not getting many of those people going to the field anymore. They haven't disappeared from the planet. They're doing more lucrative things or they're treated as, as professionals. So this absence of content has sort of left, left people, educators and regular people disarmed. They don't have the facts and none of the knowledge to know when something is complete and utter BS. They just don't. And that's a huge problem. We have to work on countering that. Massachusetts in the Stotsky years had some success at it. We need to look at how to make this bigger nationally. Okay, let me, um, we're going too far. Let me um, look at, and let me share another picture real quick. So uh, 1619 also, in defining America about its racism, which is crazy, it ignores, let me get this, okay, uh, see all photos. Let me see if I can figure out how to show this other photo. Uh, I'm sorry, don't continue. Um, can people see, yeah. I'm trying to get out of something. Can people see this other photo? No, uh, you'll have to click the, the green share button down at the bottom and select the, the green share at the bottom. Okay, let me see if I can do that. Um, of sh Zoom. Uh, share screen. Okay, can people see this photo? It's a bunch of kids and grown ups. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, this was at a, uh, my, my son would hate me using this, but um, uh, today's multicultural American. My son goes to the school in Texas. You probably haven't heard of it. It's the State University in Texas with most years, the largest number of National Merit Scholars. As I understand it last year, Texas a and had a few more, but we have way more than UT Austin. Uh, it's University of Texas at Dallas, and it's only about a third white Anglo. And my son's major computer science, in particular his honors program, is probably about 10% white Anglo. And there he's getting an award. And you'll notice, you'll notice my son pretty easily because he's the only white Anglo on the stage. And if you look at the other teams getting the awards, there would most of them probably wouldn't have anybody who looks exactly like him, and it's fine. These are mostly people from South Asia, a fair number from East Asia, a surprising number from Latin America, first and second immigrants and first generation Americans. Um, now, if America is like the most racist place ever, if you've got to define America by its racism, how could this happen, right? How could, how could, how could immigrants from Nigeria be making more on the whole than whites? How could Asian immigrants, at least after they're here 20 years, be on the whole making more than whites? And of course, the reason is probably that we're not an incredibly racist nation. Right? Um, we're a country of people like Barack Obama and Nikki Haley, who are working hard and doing fine, even though they're pretty darn dark skinned, and people like my old friend Rod Page, and all kinds of other folks defining America by its racism is is both silly and wrong and wrongheaded. Actually, I asked my son one time, is it being a white guy affect what you do at all? I said, no, nobody really cares if you're a good programmer. And he thought it was kind of a dumb question. And his best friend has been strongly encouraged to return to a third world country I won't name to take over the family business and is refusing because he was born in Texas. He's a US citizen. He knows that country well, and he knows America, and he chooses to stay in Texas. He's a Texan. He's not a, he's not from the place his parents are from, because America is actually a pretty cool place for people of all races. Um, so, and relatively, I kind of jokingly, I divide American colleges and universities into sort of two kinds of places. We're kind of the, there are universities that that woke and universities that work. If you want to be woke, if you want to network. Networking versus versus working. If you want to be at a university that, that's about, all about networking, go to Harvard, go to UT Austin, go to a lot of elite places. If you want to go to a university that's about working, like the old city University of New York, go to University of Texas at Dallas. Go to some of the heavily Asian universities in the UC system, like UC San Diego, where my daughter is thinking about going. Um, th those are, I think, the future of the country. They're, the they're where the new products are gonna get invented. And those people tend to actually be pretty patriotic. They tend to like America because they know what other places are like. Um, so uh, this is something we need to be teaching. And these are, are folks 
who need to lead this movement in a lot of ways because it's harder to accuse them of racism. Um, think curriculum, get your state to adopt core knowledge or something similar. I guess I already mentioned that. Um, by the way, Edie Kirsch's interview last Friday was called Bad Teaching is Tearing America Apart. And he's absolutely right. The Core Knowledge Foundation has immense possibilities. It's never had the money and the vision to go national the way 1619 does. What if the Washington Post decided to promote core knowledge in the way that the New York Times has promoted 1619? It could become a national curriculum fairly quickly, I think. And I'll return to that in a minute. So think, think, um, think decades. We've got to think of this as a 20 or 30 year battle, right? The New York Times has been at this a long time. We need to be at this for as long as it takes or the country will die. It really will. And, you know, my kids will move to Canada, which is an okay place, but I prefer America. Um, think the media. Everybody here should write op-eds about this. I promise I will in the next couple of days. Um, for your leading state newspapers, think allies. The Washington Post hates the New York Times. They always have. They're rivals. Um, the Washington Post also kind of likes the American state. One reason why the Post hates Trump, there's a lot of good reasons to hate Trump. I kind of hate him myself. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, you know, you don't have to vote for either Trump or Biden. There are other choices. The um, um, Washington Post hates the New York Times in part because the Washington Post actually kind of likes the American state. They do kind of want America to continue. After all, the, the American state is the town business in Washington. Every Post reporter is married to somebody who works for government, including often the Defense Department. So uh, I, would, I would try to make, um, I would say the center left is the natural ally. The center left is constantly talking about Trump tearing down democracy. I think a lot of them actually believe it. And so I think the Washington Times, somebody's pointing out, what about the Washington Times? It's a great institution, but it doesn't have the clout. This battle has to be won by the center left. We on the center right and the right can and must play a role. But the center left, ultimately, they're the ones who are going to win it because they have the cultural power to do it. And a lot of them favor this argument. Mainstream historians, I think, think 1619 is pretty silly. But they're probably a lot of them afraid to attack it because then they'll get called racist. And there's no more awful thing that can happen to your career. I have a funny episode about that in my career I can talk about. Um, the, um, so it's, it's got to be the center left who wins this. I would try to, try to you know, suck up to Jeff Bezos, suck up to the Washington Post board, convince them that if we don't build support for things like representative government and free speech, it's all going to go away. And the New York Times think it, thinks it'll go away by a dictatorship of the woke left. Guess what? It could very easily go away based on a populist dictatorship from the right. It could work either way. We could become Venezuela, which, by the way, last I checked, has not worked out so well. Or we could become the Philippines or, or Brazil, which maybe in their own way also haven't worked out so well. Sensible liberals don't want either. And they have got to be our allies in this. Okay, so let me throw in a bunch of little ideas. Uh, again, We're running out. I'm sorry, what? A couple what? more minutes. A couple more minutes, okay. Get that map of the time time frame of abolition in every school wall, everywhere. I was on my school board till recently when I was beaten by somebody well to my right, actually. I like her a lot. And she and I have already conspired about how to keep 1619 out of our town. The, um, uh, the PC board was kind of appalled she got elected. I was delighted she got elected because it meant I didn't fight that fight anymore. And uh, I can do other things now. Uh, and I, I do like her anyway. Um, teach the founding. I asked my daughter, how can you do this? She'd use original sources original sources constantly, but also teach race. Race until the century didn't mean African-American. Race meant Irish, Italians, Jews, things like that. Look at the restrictions mentioned earlier this week on Irish suffrage in Massachusetts in the 1840s. Look at the no Irish need apply signs that were ubiquitous in the US. Look at the efforts to destroy Catholic schools in the late 1800s and early 1900s, led by progressives with allies like the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, once again, professors, progressives are attacking religion, attacking Catholic schools and homeschooling, just as the Nazis did, just as people who want unitary government, want rule by one faction, always do. This is not in keeping with what the founders wanted. It is not. I've written some stuff on that. Um, give every school copies of Thomas Sowell's The Real History of Slavery. Any billionaires in the audience listening, we can, we can fund this. Um, have pictures of the founders and the cast of Hamilton both on every school wall. The ideas are the same. Who cares what the color is? The founders were all white men, but they didn't like slavery. They wanted freedom. Cast of Hamilton, all black guys. I guess you could call it racial appropriation. Who cares? I don't care about cultural or racial appropriation. I care about ideas. 
I don't care what your race is if you're a good computer programmer, right? It should be the same about ideas. Uh, that's what America is founded on, I think, to a much greater degree than slavery. Um, the um, uh, lobby to get core knowledge in every school in the country. It's vital. It's important. Um, I guess that's all. The, uh, by the way, I'll, I'll say one final thing about the Post. During the great awakening of the spring, when a lot of journalists were fired, I don't recall the Washington Post firing anybody. And in fact, they opined that what the New York Times was doing was bad journalism, which is absolutely right. You've got to find natural allies who ideologically you might not 100% agree with, right? The Cold War was not won by the right. It, I mean, Reagan did the finishing touches, but it was largely developed and run by people in the center left, right? We have to develop allies. We have to get better at that. That requires better marketing. It also requires sitting down with people you disagree with. My biggest ally on school board was the local teachers union, who I totally disagree with nationally on everything. Guess what? Our local teachers union were mostly a bunch of cranky advanced placement teachers who felt that the primary role of our high school should be teaching rather than football. Hey, we have our disagreements. On this, we can agree. There are also damn good teachers in the hall. Look for allies. Okay, I'll leave it at that. I've talked way too much. I'm glad to send this talk to anybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moranto. Before we turn uh, to individual questions for each of you, uh, tell me if I'm correct here in summarizing what I think I've heard from the three of you and during your very thoughtful presentations. And that, I think what I hear you saying is this, that if the moral narrative that is the 1619 Project, becomes the national self-understanding, it will mean the destruction of America as founded. I would, uh, I would want to leave the country because why would I want to be part of something whose defining characteristic is slavery? So I, 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 would, I would go. Yeah. Okay, good. Doctors Gass and Johnson, anything on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess from my, um, you know, from my point of view, a lot of this, I mean, I can say it from, I'm from New England and I can say these kind of things, but it, it you know, it's a kind of, I think a lot of the political correctness and a lot of these movements, it's a kind of corrupt Puritanism. It, it, it tries to, to kind of peer into people's souls in ways that are, Inc incredibly uh, difficult for anyone over time to maintain. And you know, I think there was a there was a short story that Hawthorne did, I think it was called Earth's Holocaust, where he talked about this sort of puritanical impulse to throw all these old heraldry and weapons and all these things on this fire. And at the end, sort of the, the lesson is, you know, the old world will return. And the fact is, is that if you apply the kind of criteria that I think many of the folks that are driving this uh, want, no one can stand up to it. There can't be any heroes or heroines because human beings have failings. Often great human beings have great failings. And I think that the, you know, the bottom line is that, the, and I think that the, my uh, co-panelist uh, touched on this, is that America is a country of, based on principles. It's unique in that regard in the sense that you can learn to subscribe to a variety of principles and then you can become an American, right? And I mean, no one entirely knows how to become, you know, French, I guess, you know, but, uh, but the, the bottom line is, is that, um, you know, it, 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 that's why it's so vitally important for us to teach history, warts and all. I mean, look, I think there's a lot of great work that's been done in the last 30 years on slavery. I think there's a difference between history and mythology and kids should learn about slavery. The Hugh Thomas, great Thatcherite, great historian of uh, Spanish empire wrote a terrific book in 1997 on the slave trade. It's excellent. And there's a lot of other work. David Brian Davis has done great work on it. And uh, there's some folks at, at Emory, uh, yeah, university are also doing great work on it. And I think that those conversations should be brought to bear. We can't hide from uh, the deficiencies of the country and we can't uh, hide from the deficiencies sort of sewn into human nature. But I guess the thing that I ultimately get worried about is, is that, you know, the, the, this, you know, it's kind of, it's a revolution that kind of begins to feed on itself. And I, I, I grew up in the western part of Massachusetts around Mount Holyoke College and Smith College. 
I think Dinesh D'Souza or someone cited that these were one of the early places to have these speech codes. And uh, that I think this in some respects is the logical extension of, but ultimately it's a kind of revolution that it kind of consumes itself. And I think that's sort of the, one of the central uh, deficiencies. And, and I'm, so I, I'm, I'm a little more optimistic that like the French Revolution or uh, sort of the more uh, militant strains of Puritanism will kind of consume itself over time. I think that said, there's a great deal of work to do because it's dangerous. It's dangerous because it, it shrinks the uh, historical imagination. It ignores facts and evidence. It, uh, it deprives kids of, a, of a, a more balanced understanding of what the human experience is. And I think the bottom line is, is that if there's anything that the founders and enlightenment style education did was try to sample widely from all the historical examples going back to antiquity to try to apply reason and facts and evidence uh, to, to inform good policy. So um, that's my two cents. <laughs> okay. Richard, has there ever been a country that whose own school system taught its students that their country was evil? not worthy of allegiance? And can a country survive so educated? No. Uh, short answer is no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, ignorance is public enemy number one here. Um, and if we allow ignorance to rule the day, uh, the outcome for, for America is, is grim. Um, to, to characterize the American experiment and the human experiment uh, totally based on slavery would be, would be minimizing the greatness of humanity and, and our nation. And I say humanity first, uh, because we as human beings are, going, are forever evolving, always becoming, never to be, but forever evolving and America, uh, the greatness of America is its, its evolutionary process. Uh, mm -hmm. It's gone through an ev it's going through, not gone through, but going through an evolutionary process. It's forever growing. And you know, to to wipe out uh, to wipe out the history, that portion of history uh, um, in our, on the map, uh, which would be slavery would be you know, a disservice to the process. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to remember uh, Crispus Attucks. I like to remember Frederick Douglass. You know, I, write, I like to, of course, I like to remember Booker T. Washington. He's, he's one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't always agree with W.B. Du Bois, but, you know, I, I like to read about Du Bois. Carter G. Woodson, The Miseducation mm -hmm. of the Negro, um, mm -hmm. all the way down uh, to uh, MLK, Martin Luther King in, in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, one of my favorite during that, during that period, because we, we both share the same alumni, is James Former, the founder of, cool. of Congress on Racial Equality and, and Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, matter of fact, he spoke at my, my commencement. And uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to meet him and, and talk to him. Uh, so I, I don't want to forget uh, the, the, their, the role that they played in this American experiment. Uh, nor do I want to forget the role that Thomas Jefferson played, George Washington played, uh, Abraham Lincoln, you know, and all of the great men and women throughout our history. That would be a mistake for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen the human experience uh, grow far beyond 13 colonies in, in the United States of America. Uh, we, we, we started out with those 13 colonies, now look at us, you know, and now look at our population. Uh, and so I, I appreciate the wisdom of our founding fathers to create a foundational document like the Constitution that could withstand a test of time and be amended as life continue in, in our United States continued to grow. Uh, and so 
you know, one of our, my colleagues, one of my panelist colleagues said earlier, we're going to have to market better. We're going to have to get out there and market the truth. Mm -hmm. And I, and I like the, I like the words that he used. He said, objective truth, mm -hmm. not subjective, mm -hmm. objective truth. And we're going to, we're going to have to combat uh, the voices of ignorance uh, with objective truth. And, and, and that's going to take a lot of resources. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of commitment. Uh, but I think it must be done. Uh, Lincoln looked down the face of what would look that stare down the barrel of what he would consider to be a civil war approaching, but it must be done. And, and, but I'm a lot, I'm very uh, optimistic about it, Tom. I, I'm extremely optimistic because Martin Luther King said something very profound. He said, the moral arm of the universe is long, but it always mm -hmm. bends toward justice. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that might is gonna make right. I think that right is gonna win at the end of the day. I think that right is gonna carry the note at the end of the day. I've seen a lot of changes in the last three years, uh, three and a half years. I've seen, uh, you know, some unconventional things uh, that have hurt, that have happened in our system, that have caused us to even grow faster into the uh, and lean further into the Constitution. And I think that's the reason why we see the extreme left coming out attacking the Constitution so with all they have right now, because America is now leaning faster and more forward into the into the Constitution. And you know, whether you like uh, President Trump or not like President Trump, you know, he can be accredited, his administration can be accredited to that mobility. Uh, in that direction, simply because he's not a conventional politician. He's something different. He's an anomaly. And whenever anomaly comes along, it disrupts the whole system. Mm -hmm. And but the but what I have seen, he's more of a in his actions, more of a constitutionalist than I've seen in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh and, and so I believe that at the end of the day, just as Jefferson and, and, and Adams believe that uh, we are one nation under God. And I, think, and I believe that God is a sovereign power. And at the end of the day, my grandmother used to say, no more gonna happen for you or against you than what God wants to happen. And I believe that he is he has been in the shadows watching over America and and our and our constitution is that sword of freedom and freedom will prevail at the end of the day. I'm very optimistic about that. Amen to that. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. We'll now turn to individual questions going back uh, to Dr. Gass. Dr. Gass, tell us in your view, based on your your years of experience, what is the general state of K-12 history education in this country today? Well, you know, th thanks for the question. And, and I, in all cl uh, clarity, I'm, I'm, I do not have a PhD. So, um, but I thank you for that. <laughs> um, oh, so uh, th this, I mean, I touched on a little bit in, um, in my introductory remarks. I, I think it's in, it's in a desperate situation. And I think that you know, one of the things that I've always admired about NAS and, and Peter Wood is that I think that they have always understood that a lot of the fights that happen in schools of education and in the K-12 system uh, are kind of, uh, they're downstream from the original fights that went on in academic departments decades ago. Yes. And, and so, you know, one of the things I guess I see in, in schools of education, which still train most of the teachers that are in our schools, and, and increasingly that's even true, unfortunately, in a lot of private and religious schools. There was a time when private and religious schools would draw on nuns and priests, or they would draw on people that only had an academic um, undergraduate degree and an academic you know, master's degree, not teaching and then oftentimes they do a sort of crash course in teacher preparation so that they have the basics of 
pedagogy or classroom management. But, you know, I think that, that you know, it, it's in the scheme of things, it's not always that uh, uh, sexy, but the fact is that a lot of the decisions that occur in the K-12, or, sorry, in uh, uh, teacher preparation programs are, have an enormous, enormous impact on this country, even though I think many people know that schools of education are not the, the, the most desirable or often the best departments within any college or university. And so I think that, you know, a lot of energy needs to be put on uh, in, in higher education, you know, holding up a light to or a, a focus on teacher preparation programs, because it's not as though they are just uh, exclusively kind of backwaters, they do have an, a direct impact on what is that's taught in the schools, the teachers, the various figures that are end up in um, teachers unions or trade groups that control a lot of the conversation uh, around it. But I think it's, you know, it's it unfortunately is not in a, in a great, in great shape. But, you know, one of the formative experiences in my life, I had an opportunity to visit Berlin about two months before the Berlin Wall came down. And I remember traveling the 90 miles or so into Berlin um, and having the East German uh, soldiers take you off the bus and the dogs went over your luggage and, and then you, they got back on the bus and then went into Berlin and you got to see the Berlin Wall and it was very real. And then two months later, you know, miraculously, it was over. <laughs> and so I think things, you know, can change very, very quickly. And I think one of the things you find about this moment is that for good or for ill, parents through seeing what kids are taught on Zoom or what see, they're seeing how unresponsive the K-12 system is to what it is that they are, their kids are being taught at all, um, or getting a chance more in a more close up way to see what it is that our kids are learning or not learning. I think it's in a way shining a light on a lot of the deficiencies that a lot of people around K-12 education have observed for many, many decades. And that people like Edie Hirsch has tried to kind of implore policymakers to pay attention to. And, you know, I think it's one of the reasons why it, even at the age of 92, he did a piece in the Wall Street Journal that highlights and interviews him. And he's got a new book coming out that actually addresses a lot of these kinds of topics, gets so much traction and attention, because I think that if there's one thing that has been, and we've all touched on it before, is that really there isn't as much education in education. There is a willful kind of neglect of knowledge more generally. And I think that that is specifically true in history for a variety of different reasons. But, you know, uh, you know we, we have a tremendous amount of work to do, but I think, look, there are folks at, at Heritage and other organizations that are doing really great work, NAS and others, that I think are doing yeoman service to try to be, you know, get people to really wake up and see what's going on. We, at Pioneer, we've done that. We've had, we did numerous events on every major phase of American history. We had uh, Gordon Wood and James McPherson. We had Taylor Branch. Uh, we had Bob Moses, who was head of voter registration in Mississippi for SNCC. Uh, we've done events with Sapphira Shuttlesworth, the widow of Fred Shuttlesworth, events on E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. And it's true of those kinds of events you can get a lot of people to show up. They're interested in it. And I've done a lot of op-eds in Massachusetts. An op-ed about, I don't care whether it's the War of 1812 or the, or the French Revolution or what have you, it will always run. They're, 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 it, I think it's one of these places where the parents and the general population actually has a much better sense of it than the policymakers do. And that's one of the reasons why, in spite of the fact that it's a, it looks like a dire situation, I'm more optimistic because I think there is a kind of native common sense about Americans that know that a lot of this stuff is just nonsense and a waste of their kids' time. And it gives them a very um, jaundiced view of a country that I think people know, in spite of its faults, has got a, just a ton of virtues, in particularly in comparison to a lot of countries in the world. So that's, uh, that's my, my, my take. Thank you, Jamie. Um, uh, Dr. Johnson, we have a specific question here, uh, which reads, does the current American history curriculum address the events leading up to the United States Constitution? 
No, I think they need to. Uh, I, I think there, there's a definite need uh, if, if we're going to study history and, and understand history, uh, we have to understand what led up to the moment. It's interesting. Uh, <laughs> I'm an old army guy and I, and I, my oldest son got into a, a scuffle at school one day and the principal, the vice principal called me over and I sat down and my son thought that, okay, yeah, my dad's here, you know, the, the cavalry, cavalry has arrived. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I said to, the, to the, uh, my son, I said, well, tell me what led up to the moment. <laughs> he said, well, you know, we went into the cafeteria and, uh, and we sat down to eat and this other person said something to a friend of mine and I didn't like what he said to a friend of mine. And so I then, you know, intervened and asked him to step outside and then, you know, then pushing and shoving happened. And I said, okay. Uh, and so I said to, uh, I said to the, to the principal, I said, I think I got the clear picture of what, what, what's going on here. And I said to my son, I said, now, you know, I'm an old army guy. Your dad's an old army guy. I said, so automatically when we go to the dining facility, that's to eat, not to be talking. <laughs> so, so first of all, you were wrong for talking while you should have been eating. <laughs> and so you were focused on the wrong thing. Yes. And so basically, you know, as we teach American history, we have to lead up to, we have to talk about, you know, the influence of the John Locke, you know, in terms of the American constitution. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about the influence of Blackstone. We have to talk about the influence of, of Montesquieu. And, and so we we're actually teaching our, our students, you know, the totality of our history. And, um, and so I think that's very important for us to do. And I don't think that we do that. And uh, now, well, hey, we, we really don't get into teaching just basic constitutional uh, knowledge at all now. Uh, and so those of us who are fighting the good fight uh, on the battlefield for, for objective truth uh, to be heard, I think we're going to have to include that uh, in, in our messaging tone. Yes, uh, just to add to your point, <clears throat> I mean, America is in a civic literacy crisis, right? I mean, the US, United States Citizen and Immigration Services Citizenship Test, 10 questions. All you have to get is six out of 10 right to become, now the good news is 90% of immigrants pass it the first time, and that's great. The bad news is this, only 19% of native born Americans under the age of 45 can get even six out of 10 right, which raises the question, can the American people be expected to defend what they don't even understand? On that happy note, Professor uh, Moranto. Uh, let, me, let me say one thing, Tom. Let no, me jump no, right, right ahead. Before you, pass, before you pass the mantle. Crisis breeds opportunity. And that is a that is a, a, a charging order for us to get out there and make sure that we are we are bringing civic education strong. We're bringing it strong and we're taking it to we're taking the fight to them in the street. I just want to throw that in before you moved on to the next. No, I agree. And, and uh, one last thing in response and, and uh, the audience, the NAS audience, I'm sure is somewhat aware of this. There is a national movement across the country that goes under the name of Action Civics. And what it does is it starts where we start. And that is with the fact that only 19% of native born Americans under 45. Can, and they say the reason for that is because we've been doing what uh, former Secretary of Education Arne Duncan called your grandmother's civics. And so even though those of us who know the field know that in the last 50 years, we abandoned a content-based 
approach to civic education. So now the, the pretended solution is that students will learn by doing civics. Uh, our, uh, the Texas Public Policy Foundation just released a research study on action civics. And this may not surprise any of you, but in the final count, it doesn't teach the, doesn't teach the duties of citizenship. All it really does is teach kids how to protest in favor of left-wing causes. And this movement is sweeping the country. On that second happy note, uh, uh, Professor Maranto, you were kind enough to, to send us a, a reading list for the audience. Um, would you like to talk about that a little bit for the audience? And perhaps if you wanna put it up on the share screen, I hate to ask Ooh, okay. you another share screen. Let's see if I can do it on the share screen. Let me, let me point out one thing first. So the, here's my, the next time there's a Republican president, here's my nominee for Secretary of Education, uh, Jonathan Haidt, or someone uh -huh. from the Heterodox Academy movement. We need someone mm -hmm. who, who values objective facts, who values ideological diversity, and if you get those things right, everything else will follow. And ideally it should be somebody from the center left like Jonathan. Uh, but John McWhorter would be amazing. I would, I would, you know, sign up for him in a second. We've got to look for the sensible center left, who, who, who want, to, want to continue America and who also believe in objective truths. Um, we, we can't just do this from the right and even the center. And, and I would say, by the way, I saw one question, sort of what, what's a good example of sort of a center left 25, 30 years? I can think of a couple. Um, one is welfare reform in the 90s, where uh, a blue-collar kid from Baltimore, I was doing factory work in Baltimore in the 70s. In the 70s, as a blue-collar teenager, I could tell it was having some very negative impacts on families, um, especially black families, white families too. And finally, by the 90s, <laughs> enough elites had sort of realized it, and Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich came together and reformed welfare. And before that, Tommy Thompson did in Wisconsin to give him a model. But these things can happen. They take a while. You have to think in terms of decades. But eventually, even elites can realize basic facts. Um, I would say another is the charter school movement, which was more a center-left movement than it was a right movement until fairly recently. And you had people like Barack Obama, based on his own experiences in Chicago, being very, very supportive of charters. He could never support vouchers. He hates religion, I, I think. And he just, he just could never go there. But he did support charters quite a bit and, and you know, was an ally in a lot of ways, at least for parts of school choice. So, you know, I think think long term, think of allies. OK, the reading list. Let me get into that file. Um, here it is. Um, yeah, Musa Algarbi. Can you see it now? Am I sharing the screen? Not yet. Not. OK, let me look at the bottom. Oh, share screen. Share screen. How do I do? Oh, there it is. I think. Does it work? Yes. We're excited. Okay. This is my whole my whole talk there. Uh, there was a wonderful Manhattan Institute thing, the Great Awakening, um, which, of which 1619 I would say is part of, led by the New York Times, arguably. My friend Musa Al Garbi, who's a progressive, my favorite progressive. He's a wonderful guy, wonderful scholar. Uh, Zach Goldberg, Eric Kaufman, Ram Salim. Um, uh, that was just a month back, two months back. Um, Edie Kirsch's works, um, the something I wrote, which really summarizes Thomas Sowell's thing, uh, this Juneteenth, read the real history of slavery. I reread it for every Juneteenth and tell my kids about it. It's a wonderful essay and it's stuff you know, to teach in school and we should be disseminating that widely. And my essay you can click on for free at frontpagemagazine.com from a year back. Uh, why intelligence is missing from American education policy and practice and what can be done about it. I did with a friend and colleague who's a psychologist who studies intelligence. Um, I think that one thing that the right is accused of, I think kind of accurately a lot of times, is that a lot of times that we in the center right and the right don't think enough about race and don't think that, that people of goodwill really may see things differently based on their own experiences. And sometimes those experiences do include racial discrimination. And so I've always argued the organization that does that best, that all of us should be, should be uh, answering Dr. Johnson, I think mentioned it, the US Army. All we can be, black leadership and racial integration in the Army way. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, also look at, at uh, uh, Colin Powell's wonderful autobiography, but um, All We Can Be, Black Leadership and U.S. Integration in the Army Way by the late West University by John Sibley Butler at University of Texas, who's still around. Um, if you want to understand our opponents and some of these things, Cynical Theories by Pluck Rose and Lindsay. It was just published this year. It's a wonderful book. I mentioned Thomas Sowell's Real History of Slavery. Timeline of Slavery is great. Actually, let me throw anything else that isn't on there and should be. One of the best essays I've ever read on race, and uh, my friend Craig Frisbee and I are editing a Minding the Campus set of essays on sort of sort of where why right, white fragility is the wrong approach for America and is factually inaccurate and all that. And we'll probably have an essay on 1619. My friend George Yancey at Baylor University wrote a wonderful piece for Pathios about two months back called and you can Google it called Not White Fragility, Mutual Responsibility, which I thought, like all we can be, is a much better way to approach race relations. You know, the world, people don't get everything wrong. I mean, they, they do get some things right. And I, and I think that's, that's again, that's why free speech is so important. Free speech, if speech isn't censored, we're forced to engage with people we may not agree with. And we, we almost always learn something from that experience. We have a huge problem with 1619 because it is censoring out really 85% of the field of, hist of American history and all of the field of American economic history. And that makes it frankly ignorant, um, which is I guess probably kind of what the New York Times is intending. Um, but anyway, so the, those are some of the things I would say to, to look at. Yeah, you mentioned the absences in the uh, New York Times 1619 project. We had a panel on Monday where it was pointed out Frederick Douglass is virtually invisible. Yes, in yes. How on earth can you talk about slavery without talking about Frederick Douglass? It is, it is curricular malpractice. And well, because when you read, well, I mean, Jones was uh, uh, savvy in leaving him out because if she had left him in, there wouldn't have been a 1619 project. She had to, she had to. Yeah, she had to, that's right. And, okay. and I don't, in a way, and this is where I don't disagree with Jamie for a second. You're saying this is out of some moralistic impulse. Sure, some of it is, but a lot of it is just to make money, right? So how much do people doing this, how much money do they make? How much money does the white fragility lady make? Which if you look at her Facebook page, she doesn't actually know any black people. <laughs> I've lived in integrated settings almost all my life and worked in them, et cetera. Um, the, um, you know, a lot of this, frankly, is just profiteering. If it's P.T. Barnum. It's profiteering off people's ignorance. Yes, yes. I'm sad to say it is. Um, back to you, Jamie. Um, let me ask you a question about the effect on the teaching of history of both the Common Core as well as the movement towards social, what is called social and emotional learning. Great. Thanks so much. So we have done a ton of work over the last 10 years on Common Core. We did a paper with uh, Sandra Stotsky and now the late Ralph Ketchum, who was the oh, biographer, wow. uh, one volume biographer of uh, James Madison. I think he had, was the editor of the Madison papers for a while, as well as the editor of the Franklin papers. And they really took it apart sort of piece by piece how Common Core was particularly bad for teaching history. David Coleman, of course, is now the, he was a key architect of Common Core and he's uh, then ascended to the college board where he's had the same kind of negative impact on both the SAT and the, uh, and a push uh, that uh, NAS has done such an effective job of criticizing. But, you know, the, the fundamental problem, I think, I mean, Coleman is a guy who has a lot of the kind of academic pedigree, went to Yale, he's a Rhodes Scholar. So I think that a lot of the DC players and, and uh, Bill Gates, who was a big funder, I mean, uh, Robert talked a lot about the, the great largesse that's being thrown at a lot of these folks. I mean, uh, Coleman is doing quite well, I think, and a lot of his associates in the Common Core have, you know, done quite well on it. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of just good old fashioned self-interest at, at work. But, you know, the fundamental problem with Common Core is, is that it, it really, uh, I mean, he, he's used this term cold reading. So you don't, you don't read the Gettysburg Address or the letter from Birmingham jail and look at the context of uh, Lincoln consecrating a cemetery in the middle of the war or MLK is writing the letter from Birmingham jail and all of the tumult and uh, going on around him in, in Birmingham. 
that you read it in this kind of cold way that ignores context. And that is poison, I think, because anyone who cares about history, anyone cares about uh, the writings of MLK or Lincoln or anyone else knows that you have to understand the context. Any great document, any great speech, any great letter, uh, the you know numerous biographies of Frederick Douglass where he talks about almost every one of them, he starts to talks about how uh, you know terrible it is to not know his birthday, right? you have to forget all that, right? And that, that's one of the reasons why it's particularly bad uh, for, uh, for teaching history. And I think that even though it, it, it supposedly has a kind of informational text outlook that some people I think cautiously thought would trend toward nonfiction, I don't think that 10 years after Common Core that could be claimed to be true because the fact is, is that the English language arts or reading uh, scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress have, have been abysmal now for 10 years. We've got 10 years of data on it. And so on top of all of the kind of ramming it down states' throats through all these extra legal mechanisms and federal overreach, it fundamentally is, is mediocre. And I think that was one of the cases that Sandy and others tried to make is that the academic quality is just isn't very good. And I can just, I'll speak to it again, how it related to Massachusetts, which I think everyone regarded having the best, not only English standards, but then history standards that were aligned. So kids would be reading, uh, you know, they'd be would be reading Hawthorne and uh, Scarlet Letter while simultaneously learning about Puritanism or uh, Massachusetts colonial history, or they'd be reading Moby Dick and then they'd be learning about uh, whaling or or ships or what have you. And the same was true of Twain and, and uh, slavery and, and Reed and Huckleberry Finn. And so they, the way Sandy crafted it was that they complemented one another, that the English curriculum and standards were seamlessly interwoven with the history standards. And I think that you know most historians will tell you that really good history is written in the narrative style. So, um, it really kind of, it, there's something I think very soulless about the way Common Core uh, is taught and, uh, and, and which makes it an, an enormous problem. And I think it'll can be continued to be a problem as long as it's around. It's why I think that even at this late date, people should be very vocal about the, the poor academic quality of it that, and, and the poor academic quality that has in a way been enshrined by the college board and uh and you know i think that we have to be aware again as i said earlier that there are people that pe we've seen as sort of uh um partners over the years in the right-leaning world like the fordham institute who in all appearances seem right-leaning but when push comes to shove they will side with david coleman they'll decide they'll side with uh a weaker quality a push they'll si side with weaker quality standards that make it frankly a lot easier for these other, um, other uh, I, I don't think that they would, I, would just, I don't think describe them as politically correct, but I think that they, it makes it a lot easier once you have a kind of, uh, oh, um, you know, uh, workforce development or a kind of cold reading or a kind of less, what I would regard as a genuinely liberal arts outlook about education and you've embraced utilitarianism then I think it's gonna just naturally gravitate to what it is that we have now. And, and in fact, a lot of the high quality academic defenses that you would use to make the case for uh, a curriculum found grounded in the, lib in the liberal arts or primary sources falls on deaf, deaf ears because institutional players have gone to bat for some bad ideas. And I'll jump in really quick. I think that some of the people on the the right and the center right, Edie Hirsch, although he's a man of the left in a lot of ways. Uh, Edie Hirsch, I would say also, Fordham, they jumped in thinking, okay, we'll have national standards and we'll fix them. So I saw that as more of a tactical decision than a strategic decision. Um, I would say that the thing about basically schools being by vocation uh, and, and child basically babysitting, that's been true since 1918, since the cardinal principles of secondary education, which I would urge everyone to read, 
they were, the system was held together for a while though by, by really smart teachers who were into content. Those teachers have been gone for two generations now. Again, they're not gone, they're, they're doing other things, um, numbers. And, and so I, I think that how do, you, how do you undermine that over time? We've got to see this as a 20 or 30 year battle. We've got to clean Sandra Sotsky's. She's like 88 now. We need to have a bunch more Sandra Sotsky's and I don't know where they are who have that kind of impact in a state bureaucracy over a period of years. We also need to, to continue to support the school choice movement. Interestingly enough, where parents get to choose whatever they want, they tend to choose things, choose things like Boys Latin in Philadelphia, and they tend to choose things like Basis and Great Hearts in Arizona and Texas. And, and so I think those are the ways that over time we can undermine this, but that vocational view, it, vocational and babysitting view is so strong. It, it's it's going to take 20 or 30 or 40 years to overcome it. And we just have to think about how to do that over the long term. But here again, I'm wondering, so why couldn't Common Core become 1619? If we get Peter Thiel or somebody to put 100 million into it, if we got the Washington Post to champion it, think about billionaires and media platforms that actually might care about America not splitting apart. I think that's kind of where you have to go with it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson, we have a specific question here about teaching American history. What, in your view, is the greatest misconception associated with Article I, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution? Ah, it's the, uh, the greatest misconception there is the, uh, the three-fifths compromise. Uh, you know, basically... Uh, most people have heard that, you know, the three-fifths compromise meant that, you know, America saw black people as being three-fifths of a human being. But there again, without, without reading Article I, Section 2, uh, individuals would not know that, that the Constitution never spoke to anybody as being property. It, bas it basically points out that these are different persons. And then if you break it down, it was a, a prior to the, the constitution, uh, the, way that, uh, the way that the colonies basically uh, assessed tax was at that time was done based on, on the value of land and not on population. And so when they when they brought forward the constitution said, look, this is how we're going to set up our government, and it's going to be based on population, how we will choose, you know, uh, or a portion for uh, for 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 uh, powers of in the House of Representatives, seats in the House of Representatives. And so the South said, well, okay, we want to count all of our folks, all of our people. And well, at that time, uh, about 20% of America was slaves and then about, and about 40% of the South. And so that would have given the South uh, the, the larger power portion oh, in, in, in the new House of Representatives. So uh, the, uh, the North said, well, okay, well then we're gonna assess you, everybody on tax. We're gonna, we're gonna assess your tax based on that apportionment. And so they said, well, then that means we're going to pay more money than everybody. <laughs> and so they said, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, well, then we'll only count out of every five uh, individuals that are there that are not that are not free people. We'll only count three. Three out of five. And so then the South said, OK, well, we're not going to be as strong as we would like to be. Uh, which if we, if they would count every, every person that was enslaved, enslaved at that time in the South, slavery never would have ended because the South would have been so overwhelmingly in power. And, uh, and, and so they said, well, look, it's going to be a little bit of a tax break. It was, what, what it was called was a three-fifth compromise. And it was to basically set a portion uh, based on population uh, to deal with the question of how many representatives uh, a state would have and then how much tax a state would be assessed. Nothing to do with the humanity of a person. Uh, and I think that is the biggest misconception out there. I've had that argument with some constitutional scholars in the African-American community. And, uh, and they said, well, what about them counting us at three-fifths of a person? Well, no. 
every person in the Constitution is counted as a whole person. Is now how much are we going to assess you in terms of taxes, and then how much are we going to credit you for in terms of uh, political power in the House of Representatives? And yes. So I think that 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 is the that is the best, biggest misconception. Then a lot of people go out and say, "Well, I hate such and such. I hate the Constitution because it never counted me as a person." Well, that's not necessarily the truth, right? Uh, and matter of fact, in fact, it's not a truth, uh, and so. If we're, if we're able to if we're able to teach the truth objectively, um, I think that would that would clear up a lot of disdainment that people have uh, for the American Constitution and for America in itself. But we have to get back in. We have to go back to the future. Kind of like the movie Back to the Future. We have to go back to the future and start teaching the things that we were teaching, you know, in terms of civics and, 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 and history, true history, years ago, uh, seems like centuries now, but it's not a model that we have not embraced before in the past. And, and most people like not to go back to the past. Well, let's say you don't, you don't, we don't want to bring everything forward from the past, but there are some things we do want to keep. And there are some things that are valuable. Um, I like the Booker T. Washington uh, model for, for education. You know, Booker T. felt like, hey, it's great, you know, liberal arts and sciences are great, but it's also great to learn how to pour a foundation. It's also great to learn a trade or a skill, uh, not an either or, but a both and. Uh, you know, and, and I, he tells one of his students, I want you to learn how to be a poet, but I also want you to learn how to go back home and help build your town and, uh, and help renovate your town because everybody needs a bed to sleep in and, a, and shelter to be in under. And so those are the things that, that I'd like to see move forward in education. Uh, the foundation of education was designed to create a, uh, a well-informed and highly skilled and educated workforce in America. But it didn't just mean you know, um, plowing fields and, and, and building buildings and, and making crops. It also meant science, you know, it also meant uh, liberal arts. Uh, it also meant uh, now technology. Uh, and so we call career technology education. So it meant all those things. That's what America needed then. That's what America needs now. And, uh, Again, I'm very optimistic about, you know, getting the truth out there to the common man and woman. Uh, but I think that we have, a, we have a heck of a fight ahead of us. You know, and, and I, don't, I don't take the teachers union lightly. I mean, uh, my good friend and, and, and Robert's good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Page, Dr. Rod Page, I, I did my internship, uh, my doctoral internship under Dr. Rod Page. Um, and he wrote a book that specifically addresses the teachers union and, and their stand on, on education as a, as a stumbling block or hurdle that we would have to approach and, and get over. And, the, the, uh, it was The War on Hope, right? It was a great book. Exactly, exactly. I love Rod Page. And, and, uh, and so I think that fight is very real, uh, and I think it's pervasive, and uh, and we have to we have to take take it head on, and with the truth as wind at our at our back, and in terms of fighting this battle. Um, but we all have to come together. I agree that we we need we do need to make allies, and uh, and find people who are like mine, and convince those who are on the fence to come over our way. And the reasoning to come over our to our side of thinking, uh, but it's going to take a lot of marketing. Uh, we're we're up against hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, of of folks on the other side. But again, you know, we have to believe that you know, right at the end of the day, it's going to weigh weigh out, and uh, and we'll we'll be successful in this fight. I'm confident. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. We have a question uh, from the audience here addressed to all three of you. 
Uh, and it says this, and I see uh, Dr. Moranto gave, uh, uh, typed in an answer, but uh, want to find out from also from the other two. It, the question is this, regarding getting high quality teachers for lower grades, would you agree that progressive ideas and approaches in education regarding discipline, for example, have made grammar school teaching a difficult and even an undesirable job? I know highly qualified people who had a lot to give, but were discouraged by the chaos that many schools allow and expect teachers to tolerate. And then our, our uh, questioner concludes by saying, progressive ideas are making even college teaching less and less desirable. Who would start on that? Uh, I'll take a crack at that. Yes, yeah, so it's a great question. And I think it really does in, in some respects cut to the core of what ails uh, public education, at least in this country, is, is that, uh, you know, uh, Edie Hirsch's name has been used a lot, but he, I think, uh, although he certainly is more left-leaning, has always been for 30 years now, at least, uh, a real critic of progressive education. And I think that uh, the reality of it, I come from a family of educators, my wife is a teacher, and uh, I, have a, I don't know why people go into it, because it has become so cumbersome it, it, between the politics and all of the bureaucracy and the, the, the poor quality of the ideas that you find in many of the schools of education. I think it's always been and it will always remain heroic work. It's enormously important because the fact is, is that it shapes the future of, the, of children and the country, right? But uh, you've seen this with all these iterations of top-down federal initiatives. It could be Common Core, it could be a social emotional learning, it could be school to work. I mean, there's all these, they, they take children and, and teachers and schools guardrail to guardrail every few years with these new fads. And, but I think that the worst one and the most enduring one has been progressive education. Because the fact is, is that even though we're spending seven, $800 billion annually, and we have had all these enormous federal efforts, the, the independent NAEP data, the nation's report card is telling us that it's not working. And I think that the reason why is that the water in the aquarium is terrible. And the water in the aquarium is progressive education. It, it just lacks substance. It lacks uh, humanity. And I, I, I think there's a lot of teachers just that soldier on, even though the bureaucracy is growing around them, all of the ideas are poor quality, but it, I think it's had a, it, I mean, I remember this is many years ago and someone like Peter Wood might remember it when John Silber, the very shy and retiring guy who was the president of Boston University, briefly was the chair of the Board of Education in Massachusetts. One of the first things he did was bring the British philosopher, Roger Scruton over to the School of Education. And then he brought all of the senior level bureaucrats, the Department of Education over to listen to a, a speech or a lecture by Roger Scruton. And he started off the speech saying, you know, that basically John Dewey had ruined Western civilization. And now it's a, a little bit of an over-exaggeration, but you should have seen the look on people's face. But I think the fact is, is that the evidence kind of shows that one of the central problems in American education has been this commitment to this constructivism and hands-on learning and all these, you know, sort of, uh, I wouldn't even call them intellectual sort of offshoots or byproducts of progressive education that just don't work. They don't teach grammar. They don't teach uh, a lot of academic substance and children need these things. And I think that one of the, the thing that should be the biggest failure and our, the other uh, panelists touched on it is, is that in, in urban districts in this country, 30% of the kids aren't graduating. The ones that do are really well below grade level. And this is a, a national tragedy and it's largely inflicted by poor quality progressive education and the commitment to it. And it, I think that the evidence from some really good quality Catholic schools, really good sort of no nonsense charter schools, many of them are these Hirsch schools and others, is that when you focus kids and teachers and, le and learning on academic substance, lo and behold, they like it, you know? Whereas the kids are kind of voting with their feet when 30% of the kids don't graduate, what they're saying to the system is that you've lost us as an audience. 
And I mean, I just think that whether it's the founders and the founding documents or Abigail Adams or Sojourner Truth or Frederick Douglass or Churchill speeches or fill it in, that stuff is always going to be more compelling to kids because it teaches them about a common humanity. It teaches them about enduring principles that have, have uh, uh, lasted for millennia. And I just think that, that, that progressive education is just such a, it's such a thin gruel. Our kids really deserve far better and the most vulnerable kids deserve far better. Let me, let me disagree in, in two or three ways. I spent the last 20, 20 or 25 years now doing field work in schools on the school board, now 12 years, I guess, on a charter school board. And, and I think that progressive education can be quite good. I mean, if you go to charter school of Sedona, it's a wonderful little Montessori school. Montessori is basically progressive. If you have kids who are very motivated, if you have teachers who have a wide range of knowledge, it can, it can be a good thing. For working class kids like me, nah, it'd be a disaster. <laughs> it's, it's what Gene Shaw's work and others show that what you try to do this in working class communities, it doesn't fit the culture. Um, so I, I think that the problem more is that we're trying to impose a model that works in some time and places with some kids on everybody. And it's a disaster. I would also say that, that if you go to the average school, it's not that terribly progressive. And, and so... Um, again, I was kind of friendly with my local teacher union leader. I, I asked her when I actually invited her to our annual strategic planning, no other school member. I, I was the one Republican on the board and I was the one who asked her to come. So the, um, and, and she pointed out during this that in the last four years, my district had had 23 separate initiatives. So teachers weren't taking any of them seriously. I mean, a, an administrator will do an initiative to have the resume. You know, if you know, if you just wait a year and a half, that administrator will be gone to a higher position and and, it, and we'll have a new initiative, right? Nobody takes anything seriously. I actually think if you if you actually go into real schools, most of them are not run in a terribly a progressive way. Um, I think the bigger factor is that if you, if you look at in measures of intelligence, elementary ed majors are, are pretty far down there. I actually have data I want to talk to with Jamie about later. I have data from a 25 year period from the early 90s, 2017 in almost all 50 states. Elementary ed majors are, are pretty low on their SATs, ACTs. And generally they're people who go into teaching because they like schools as they are, which is pretty content free. They don't like schools as you and I would like them to be. So they want schools to be mostly social, mostly athletic, mostly this, that. They're, they're actually mm -hmm. pretty Conservative elementary ed majors of the national database are the most conservative undergraduate women. They're, they're plurality Republican, only undergrad women who are. Uh, but they're, they're not into content. They're, they're, they're nice people and they work fairly hard, but they're not into content and they're not people who do progressive education or probably are going to do the kind of education we want. Um, we have to have a different model of people going into the field to do that. And that would take many, many years. I, I certainly advocate it, but it would take many, many years. And let me I'll end with one final story. My own school district, perhaps the best in Arkansas. It's not a parable district by any means. It's way better than where I went in Baltimore County, Maryland. Over the last couple of years, we've turned down teaching applicants who had experience teaching with degrees from places like Yale, Cornell, Columbia, Berkeley, and instead hired people from, say, University of Arkansas or Arkansas Tech or University of Central Arkansas. Now, why would we do this? Because you know, those teachers, they might ask questions. They might not be good team players, stuff like that. I mean, there's, I would see educational leadership as actually more of a culprit in a lot of the stuff than the unions are. Not that the unions are helpful, they're not. Um, you know, I, I think that you have to kind of pick your battles, right? Um, but I would say get in real schools, see what's going on. It's not always what you think. Most teachers are actually reasonably happy being teachers because they love schools as they are, not as you and I would like them to be. And I think the long-term answer to that is going to be different human capital pipeline, but probably even more school choice. Let me, let me just jump right in. Yeah, I'm just going to jump right in. I just want to add one thing. I, you know, Tom, I really favor the, uh, the Dallas model that we, we use here in Texas in House Bill 3. Uh, uh, basically dealing with uh, the, the, the teachers. And, and, and they used a model that was an old military model. See, when, you, when you're in the military and you volunteer to, to go into combat zones, you get a little hazard pay. You don't, you don't get just your regular pay. <laughs> and so basically 
what we've done here in Texas, and we'll be watching this model uh, over the next few years, is create a, a an A team uh, an A team uh, scenario to go into to uh, schools and not just schools but school districts that are that are experiencing a high fail rate. And then and those teachers and those administrators are getting a little bit more uh, onto their pay. The pay is higher because prior to that, it didn't matter uh, whether you were in a great school district that was doing well or you were in a failing school district, you all still got the same amount of money. And, uh, and so what's happened now is with House Bill 3, they've said, well, look, let's incentivize some of our A-list teachers, some of our uh, special forces, so to speak, to go into some of our schools that that are that are experiencing chronic failure, like a Wheatley in Houston or a or a Cashmere in Houston. Uh, Cashmere was on the failing list uh, uh, for about 14 years, and you know I know one of the legislators' his biggest complaint was he went over and asked why were they doing so poorly in math, and in, in over 10 years they had not had a certified math teacher. Uh, because why would you leave, you know, a school or a school district that's doing very well and go into a low income area where you into a failing school and get the same amount of pay. And so what what the state of Texas has done now with House Bill 3 is said, well, look, let's incentivize some of those great those good teachers, those well-experienced teachers, those highly successful teachers, and uh, incentivize them to go back into schools where we need them, we need help. And we're, we're waiting to see how that works. It worked well in Dallas. They created the Dallas model, showed great, uh, great data in terms of schools lifting themselves out of, uh, out of IR and moving into the, into the academic success range. And I think that 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 needs to happen. I was saying that years ago, uh, just simply being in the military, I was like, well, what, what would incentivize me to go into the combat zone if, if there's no, you're not gonna, I'm not gonna get anything extra. I could just stay right here and be good. <laughs> <laughs> Everything would be all right. Uh, and, and the same thing was happening with the teachers and I was glad to see that the Texas legislature picked up on that and followed that Dallas model. And I'm looking for great things to happen out of it. Well, that is a good note to end on. And I, I'm sure I speak for our entire audience when I thank all three of you for your very, very thoughtful comments. Uh, before we say goodbye, I wanna tell our audience that our next session in this conference will be tomorrow at 11 Eastern time, Eastern time. Uh, Robert Paquette, who is the president and executive director of the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, will be giving a presentation called what made American slavery distinctive? Look forward to seeing you all tomorrow and thank you again for attending today.